moderator today, uh, David Huberman from ICANN. So, David. Sure. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, hope you had an enjoyable lunch like I did. Uh, so, we have a wonderful panel here today, uh, and we are going to be talking about DNS security in the Baltics. Um, you heard what I said this morning about DNS being a building block of how this entire internet is built. But I think everybody in this room is well aware of the fact that DNS is often used as a launching point for attacks. It's vulnerabilities in the DNS, it's different, uh, it's leveraging differences in how infrastructure is built that attackers are able to use uh, to create the chaos that they create. Um, and then on top of all that, which happens every day, now we also have a war next door that is impacting uh, our neighbors and may be impacting us. So for the purposes of this panel, uh, we have these four experts who are going to talk to us a little bit about how we can improve DNS security here in the Baltics, uh, talk about some of the things that we're experiencing today. And if we can, hopefully we can get a little bit about how we can improve the security posture of the DNS in the future. Um, so uh, we have four people who I would love to introduce, and instead I'm going to have them introduce themselves. Tomas. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Thomas Samanaitis from .LT Registry. I'm technical manager and uh, I'm mostly responsible for running day-to-day uh, -day business uh, of technical infrastructure of .LT. Great, thank you, Thomas. Timo? Hello, I'm Timo Abachmar from Estonia, .de, DLD. I am head of development there. I don't dare to call myself a like, security expert, but I try to keep up with uh, honorable guests here. Great. Patrick? And Patrick Feldstrom, head of security at Netnode, also a member of Security and Stability Advisory Committee in ICANN. And uh, I don't do as much operations as these gentlemen to the left, <laughs> maybe a little bit more security issues. Um, and I, I think that's it. Uh, hello. I'm Ivo Tjuts. Um, regardless that I'm in suit today, uh, I'm also running uh, technical operations in, uh, for the uh, .lv domain. So, uh, yeah. All right. So, Ivo, I'd, li I'd like to start with you, if we can, please. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you and I were talking earlier. Uh, can you explain a little bit to everybody how the onset of the war changed how you think about securing your DNS operations? No. So. I think we are, you, you mentioned these building blocks and uh, we are starting to focus how we can strengthen uh, these building blocks. Do we need more of them? So we, do we need uh, reliable partners who can also help us uh, to supply those building blocks? Uh, so, uh, yeah, and also uh, we have to assess the threats coming in. Uh, we see uh, Russia's war in Ukraine and uh, we also saw that uh, in the previous presentation. So, uh, for example, uh, we have a joint project with the CERT where we are filtering domain names uh, based on malware. So it, it's been for several years so for now. And the uh, new trend is that we also are filtering on the content. Uh, so the, uh, some institutions are deciding whether the content is uh, unacceptable in this country. And uh, based on that, we are uh, putting that uh, domain in the list uh, previously as a registry, we wouldn't be happy to block any do domain at all. You know, it's, it's our bread. But uh, in this slide of war, uh, it's so that we are, uh, this is a tool for us to protect our citizens here. And uh, so, we be, uh, so we are uh, looking at the resources which are not uh, somehow harming our people. And I thought uh, also what else could be done in this uh, to improve the blocking. And I thought, okay, there is uh, some other resources, like even uh, there will be maybe outrageous uh, proposal, for example, to block whole TLD. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, Soviet Union TLD, which is .su. So it basically doesn't exist anymore. And it reminds for me like uh, 50 years of occupation of the country, and it, I think it's uh, shared between the Baltic states, and 
Uh, so I'm thinking whether there is a technical solution. Uh, we could block it locally for us, but uh, maybe it's outdated. It's uh, like a relic already. And uh, maybe uh, I know that this uh, TLD is also continuing registrations. And uh, we've been uh, seeing a lot of also malware spread in that TLD. Also disinformation also. Uh, I would call it like Soviet Union version two, yeah. and uh, so if they continue registering those, those domain names, it's an uh, ongoing thing. Maybe in hopes to uh, repeat a history which we don't like, wouldn't like to happen. So, yeah, that just maybe very specific idea, but uh, that's what I shared to you. Um, Timo or Thomas, how has the war affected? the DNS operations uh, that you're responsible for? Mm, I can't say that it um, has changed much, but it has had some effects. Um, Security-wise, we almost didn't see any attacks on our infrastructure before. Now we see some. Okay. But um, I guess uh, a lot of thanks to the any cast DNS, it doesn't affect the end users that much. Um, we do cooperate with uh, uh, Estonian different agencies, CERT, police, uh, that uh, actually monitor the contents or what is going on be behind the registered domain names that we uh, ourselves don't do. And, and we, yeah, we have strengthened this uh, cooperation uh, after after the start of the war quite significantly so i guess we have better overview today of what is going on and better grasp of uh, uh, of things but yeah the effects haven't been luckily so big from our point of view at least It's on. Um, from our side, uh, I think uh, uh, guys from uh, from Ukraine said that uh, DNS is not an issue uh, because it's already distributed. You are either using your own DNS clouds or you're using some, some other solution. So for us, that was the same. But what we have um, noticed uh, right away that um, our replication of the registry system is only 100 kilometers away from each other. So in case of war, that, uh, that's a minimal distance, you know. Uh, so uh, the first thing we did, uh, we, we actually brought a replica uh, system far, far away uh, from, from the country. So that was the main change. Um, and. Uh, as far as, as, as DNS infrastructure goes, uh, that was already more or less um, satisfying. So we just kept going as, as before. So Patrick, you, you've been involved in the DNS for as long as the DNS has been around. Um, importantly, you've, you look at things at a, from a very broad perspective. You're able to see it systematically, especially with your work leading uh, the Security and Stability Advisory Committee at ICANN. As you've looked over the last 10 to 15 years um, at DNS infrastructure, as more and more of it has gone into hosted clouds, and instead of everyone building their own uh, private networks, um, what are some of the advantages, disadvantages? What, how is that evolving the security conversation when we think about cloud versus on-premises for a TLD, for root servers, and for generally for DNS infrastructure? I think, um, oh, there are so many things I would like to say. <laughs> First of all, when thinking about security, uh, I, see, I, I see, I look at security as a tradition model that you have confidentiality, availability, and correctness, okay? And I think for some reason, back and forth during the year, the last, like, since, since I started, like, just before 1990 or something, we have gone back and forth, what is the most important part of these three things? Um, we have heard, for example, when we started with DNSSEC, 
confidentiality ended up being so important, so IETF had to come up with NSEC 3, just because the zone file itself was secret. Um, now everyone has seen, now we're back to availability being more important, so people are backing off NSEC 3 because the increased complexity is decreasing availability. I have seen people building DNS infrastructure themselves quite a lot, but lately we have seen increased interest in diversity, just like we heard from our friends in Ukraine, that the more the merrier. So at the moment, I think that people want diversity. Now, what is currently going on though is that correctness, of course, is really, really important and lots of the attacks on the DNS is based on trying to spoof the responses or otherwise change the content of, of, the, DN, of the DSON file. Everything from attacks to registrar to registries, the EPP protocol or the zone files themselves. Um, so once again, people are, I see, balance, trying to balance availability and diversity with security because they believe that DNSSEC is decreasing the availability. Um, so I think the people that do the best work at the moment is doing all of this. Diversity, which means that you should, it's not the question of having your own infrastructure or someone else's. It's not about unit cost or any cost, it's probably all of that. It's probably not a question of whether you should run DNSSEC because it decreases availability. It's probably use DNSSEC, but ensure availability is high as well. So it's more building the building blocks on top of each other like we just have heard instead of comparing them. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you talked about some of the people who are building DNS infrastructure today. And look, I'm looking on the stage and it's five middle-aged people. And we've been doing this for a long time. Um, but there are a lot of young people who are there are a lot of young people who are joining this industry, who are interested in cybersecurity, asking questions. And one of the things I wanted to ask all of you is, as people who are now in leadership roles, people who have been doing this for a while, what are some of the skill gaps you would like to see new engineers who are coming out of schools, new engineers who are joining your companies in their first and their second jobs. What are some of the skill gaps you'd like to see them fill? What are some of the things that students should be studying? What are the things that they should be thinking about? What are those skills that you're looking for as you hire new people to build tomorrow's DNS infrastructure? And that's open to anyone. It's an interesting question. Uh, if I look at myself, then uh, it's uh, the knowledge probably evolved together with the internet. So uh, I start when I first uh, interacted with the internet, it was a non-graphical screen. Uh, then I started to learn more about uh, other possible protocols internet uses. And uh, so internet somehow evolved together with me, if I would. So that's maybe interesting to say, but yeah, if you start now, uh, then you already have those building blocks somehow ready and they are so much, so you have vast amount of things to learn. So, but uh, maybe you find something that is uh, what you like and uh, then you be more curious and, and, and each day you discover new things and then, then you dig deeper to understand how and why it works that way. and. and so it takes a little bit of history, probably, our, uh, uh, of the internet to, to discover things and also uh, internals of the, how the systems are built. But, uh, yeah. Great. Anybody else want to answer that? Patrick. Oh, yes. First of all, regarding DNS and other operations at NetNode, I think all people that actually do a really good job are below 30. We have been really successful at hiring young people, and let me tell you, they rock. So, number one, hire young people. They are really, really hungry. But what is important when you hire someone, it goes back to a little bit what, what you just said. When we started building and working with the internet, we had to do everything. When you have these new people that come in now, 
each topic area they're working on, DNS or routing or addressing or NTP or whatever it is, it's really much, much more an or question. So I think it's important that we, when we hire people, we should not ask the person to have or even need to have full understanding of everything. Find someone that is hungry, that want to work with DNS or some kind of database structure, whatever you need, uh, identifiers or something, and let them just dive into that topic. Don't disqualify people because they don't understand routing when they want to work with DNS. I think also a very important thing is when you find someone who is hungry, you have to actually feed them. Give as much information as possible. Uh, it, if it is already digested, you have uh, worked with that for, for 10 or 20 years, uh, you, can, you can give your best, best practices right away and that person might, uh, you know, climb, climb the ladder very quickly. Um, when I look at people we hire, you kind of have to teach them everything. <laughs> because DNS itself, it's, it's so different from what uh, people usually use in, in other IT companies mostly. So it's very, very, let's say, thin knowledge. So you have to teach them basics of DNS, public key infrastructure, all these blocks. But uh, I do agree with Patrick, that uh, I guess the one thing you should look from from anyone you hire is the curiosity or hunger for knowledge, and and young people are usually hungrier, so they are quick to learn. Yeah, I, g I guess there are people today who come into the workplace for the first time who who do know what DNS is and do know largely how it works, um, but that's certainly not a prerequisite. I was in broadcast engineering. Patrick was a mathematician. Our friend Liman was a cryptographer. I mean, there's just very different ways you can get to DNS because DNS itself is just not a natural career path, I think, for most people, especially coming out of university. Um, so that's about their knowledge and that's about their hunger. But what about your knowledge? I'm 50 years old. And one of the things that I'm coming to terms with is that my knowledge about the state of the art of technology continues to decrease. I know less and less than I used to know. And that's because I have different responsibilities. I have a family who I have to take care of. There's other things in life that I have to do other than just spend all my time sitting on my computer reading the newest paper, reading the newest attack. What are you doing, Tomas, I'll start with you. What are some of the things that you do to keep your knowledge current? Well, uh, first of all, uh, you have, I think, to, to delegate your day-to-day -day as much as possible. And then if you have, have a little bit time, just, uh, you know, read RFC 1035 is, is not, not enough. <laughs> you have to read a new, uh, new stuff. You have to, I don't know, participate into CTF. If, uh, even if that's, uh, if that's not your horse, uh, you, you, can, you can still try and, and learn new stuff every day. Timo? I, I know, it's a loaded question, but... So, I stopped pretending I know anything years ago already. So, now I just try to learn how to trust other people more and uh, find their strengths and rely on, on that as much as I can because I don't know anything. Yeah. I have always tried to continue to run my own servers, my own routers, my own DNS server, signing things and, and literally doing things on my own um, to, to force myself to be updated. If I'm not updated, I will not get email. Okay. But that is only for me, not for anyone else, because when I do the wrong things, okay, anyways. But the other thing is to, as I said, hire the young people and they work together with them. Because if you take DNS that has existed forever, we, have, we who have been working with DNS have a certain way of doing things. And I think that you need to have new people that come out with new thoughts. And what you should do is try to work together with the young people and the ones that are from different generations because they, and, and you can only tell them, no, you don't have to drive into that tree because they've already been there. But otherwise you let them come up with the crazy ideas and you try to try the crazy ideas. Don't say no. 
that's the by far the best way of, 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 of getting up to date. And then, of course, go to events like this and talk to people. Thank you, Katrina, for the invitation. So, yeah, I have noticed that the time on my hands has been uh, extremely valuable, so it's less becoming less and less uh, somehow. So, uh, probably I organize my day wrongly, but uh, when I look at my tasks, uh, then usually I see a few indicators and then I have some gut feeling how I would solve it. So, um, yeah. And uh, from technical perspective, sometimes I use ChatGPT to work for me as an assistant. And um, I, for example, if I have, I think full, full team is actually using that. So we are trying not to expose uh, some uh, information what could be uh, private to us. But uh, so the principles, technical principles, I think are, are is pretty good to share with these systems. And then you can, uh, it could be, for example, a script uh, that you could feed into the system and ask the system to uh, provide different output. Uh, this would require you, uh, the output would be provided to you in a second. Uh, so you get the result quicker. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I didn't have this practice of uh, programming thing. Yeah, things, yes, but this is another another tool that comes into IT life that I think in the future we will be continue using more and more. So there will be uh, this will be a requirement, I guess, in the future. So that if you want to be competitive, you will need to be able to work with these tools uh, to query them and get the results faster because uh, we don't have much time. To, uh, we, we need to patch everything. We need to maintain systems. We need to provide services and so on, secure. Uh, so, so many tasks during a day, and we need to do that efficiently and quickly. So. Um, while we were talking, um, there were people using menti.com. There's the code up there. Uh, one of the questions came in um, about something you said earlier, Patrick. Uh, when we were talking about DNSSEC. And the question is, is a TLD more secure when its zone file is public or should it be kept secret from the public? Um, my view is that it's more secure if the zone file is public. And the reason for that, the, of course, it depends on what you mean by more secure. Okay. <laughs> the reason for uh, having a, for being more secure from my perspective is that one, you might have more eyes looking at the zone file, doing an audit and detecting when there are issues with it, which means that not only maybe if you're nervous that your enemies might look at the zone file and see when there are changes and whatever, also your friends are looking at that. So you might be able to get help when you, when you have problem. The other thing is that it might be the case that you have big providers of resolvers that you might not have a contract with that want to preload their servers with the zone file. And, and by doing that, they can respond directly with contents from your zone file without querying your name servers, which means that even though your you, all your authoritative name servers go away, it still might be the case that the large resolvers for the mobile operators and stuff might still be able to respond from, from, with data from the zone file, even though, of course, it might be some delay in the publishing sequence. Um, and secondly, if it is the case that the second part has to do with the business logic, um, one of the reasons for not publishing the zone file is to hide when a domain name is removed from the zone um, so that you don't get bombarded with the registration request in the, when you do drop catching. That is something that I think people should resolve business-wise and policy-wise. For example, we heard about auctions this morning. We have other different kind of random drop catching processes happening. The, the, the way of protecting yourself against various malicious business activities or even load on your name server, I claim is not by having the zone file public. Um, in, in the Swedish community, now we have people from the Swedish register here, and, and I don't speak behalf of them, but I feel that as, as, as one of the individuals that try to make Sweden 
more robust and stable. I think we have gained security overall in the DNS infrastructure uh, over time when uh, .sc has over time made more and more data public, including now also the zone file. Did anybody else want to talk about uh, the security of their TLD? Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, making a zone public, uh, for example, would get rid of, of the scanners which try to enumerate the zone. Uh, so I guess um, TLDs mostly keep uh, keep the zone private, uh, maybe for the sake of registrants. Uh, maybe the new domain is, is uh, a new project which uh, a registrant wants to keep secret and so on. So not, not for the sake of, of, of security. Um, we have some more questions coming in. So this is open to anyone who wants to answer. Um, talking about diversity and the hunger to learn about DNS, um, what are some of the things that you're doing to create topic awareness, ensure the DNS is an area that's accessible to new people and their new thoughts? So as leaders, uh, what are some of the things that you do to feed that hunger um, and to create topical awareness? It's a tough question. It's a good question. It's, it's a little bit pro problematic because I think the value of DNS that originally was just to create an abstraction layer on top of IP addresses, then it grew into the value of the domain name itself because domain names turned into identifiers. I hope the DNS has moved or it, in its way to move to be that boring thing that just had to work because DNS is more and more used for the DN in TLS certificates that you then use for pinning, you use it for email, you use DNS for storage of different kind of security issues and other protocols. So to some degree, I think DNS should be boring. <laughs> so it's hard to talk about it because the interested people should work with more application layer things and other things that uses DNS. So what I do? Well, I think I try to explain what people can be used for, uh, which of course is not really the domain name registration business, but more like, okay, use the DNS for this because it's actually a good thing. For example, the big discussion at the moment, do we really need DNSSEC or is it enough with TLS? And my view is you need both because you cannot really bootstrap a TLS session or with certificate pinning or anything without a secure DNS infrastructure. But that's, for example, one discussion that is going on. Um, we try to be as open as possible, so uh, transparent, sharing what's happening, what are our plans. We have a long way to go still, but we are moving toward that. So also we have done now, I guess for a number of years already, these DNS topic uh, trainings uh, with cooperation with ICANN and invited or every, anyone, students, uh, people from telcos to participate. So yeah, we're trying to spread, spread the knowledge and, and um, light the discussions. One of the things that I see um, is an increase of interest in DNS from places that in the past probably couldn't spell DNS. Um, and especially at governments. We're finding today that because the internet has become so mission critical and in some governments now look at it as a national security matter, um, seeing more and more government bureaucrats, legislators and leaders talking about DNS because again, it is at this foundation of this house of cards that we've built, if I can use, if I can use that metaphor. Um, when in running your registries, Patrick, in looking at, this, looking at it more systematically, um, what do you see as the role of governments and what do you see as the role of civil society who are interested in helping uh, to secure the DNS? What do, you see, what do you see as an appropriate role or what do you see helpful things that governments and civil society are doing to raise 
awareness of the need for better security in the DNS and to actively contribute to that, whether it's through legislation, whether it's through um, uh, the promotion of best practices. What is it you're seeing in your day-to-day, -day, your month-to-month, -month, your year-to-year -year, uh, that's different today than it was 10 years ago when people couldn't, again, didn't know about the DNS? Uh, well, I guess what uh, we are seeing is much more regulation. Yeah. Uh, what uh, 20 years ago, uh, government actually didn't didn't care much uh, how the system is being run. Well, that's that goes for the whole internet, I guess. And uh, now there are more laws uh, enacted. For example, in Lithuania, uh, the new law comes um, into into play in in a few months, uh, where a registry will uh, have to uh, block domains if uh, uh, authorized uh, by by the. Uh, government institutions, so we see mostly mostly that, and uh, also DNS itself uh, is is seen as as a simple tool uh, for uh, content filtering, uh, where you can uh, either order ISPs to to block uh, lists of domains, be it malware, uh, illegal gambling, or or anything, and uh, that is uh, what we see mostly. Yeah. Ivo? Um, I think maybe uh, sometimes the requests from, for compliance is too overwhelming. Uh, so um, maybe um, so there is too, sometimes too much and uh, too excessive regulation requests. And uh, uh, we as a registry, we, it, it, it takes time to implement. And uh, we also have to keep work on ongoing things. I know that we. Uh, might need to identify registrants soon. Uh, so, lots of uh, unseen things ahead. And um, the help from governments, maybe that's a joint effort, and, and that starts probably from us, and also a collaboration with certs, because we, if we are talking about uh, security, uh, it, it goes into the security protocols we are using. And uh, somehow, we. Uh, it's, it's difficult to implement, but uh, probably by some uh, regulation in this, in, in a more technical field, is, is required uh, more than uh, some uh, other thing. And so if government, government would accept these technical changes to, to adopt us quick, quicker, then would be a greater benefit for all. So, Patrick? I think uh, local collaboration between CERT, local CCTLD registry, and government is the absolutely most important thing. Because countries are different. You operate the TLD differently. You have various policies in the country for what is critical infrastructure, what are critical services is different. We see that at the moment with the NATO expansion and the discussion regarding the war in Ukraine, that on national level there are various discussions about harmonization going on on the difference between and separation between cyber security and cyber defense. There are in many countries legislation that actually give different agencies responsible for cyber defense compared to cyber security. And when the government ultimately is responsible to ensure together with potentially the armed forces that critical services in the country is up and running, the, those services are most certainly using domain names in one way or another. So it's really important that that collaboration for the really important services is happening with these entities as friends. They don't have to, maybe not legislation, just holding hands and be around the campfire and talk. And don't copy too much from one country to another one because countries work differently. Um. Tomas and Ivo have both mentioned during this conversation about DNS blocking, whether it's legislatively required um, or whether it's wanted in the case of .su domains. Uh, one of the questions we got uh, from the audience was about DNS blocking and how it may be impacted by some of the new uh, protocols like DNS over TLS, DNS over HTTPS, or my favorite, oblivious DNS. Um, how do you, so in answering the question, 
Uh, how are some of the new privacy protocols impacting your ability as an operator uh, to do DNS blocking voluntarily or not? Currently, it uh, totally circumvents our blocking. So, yeah, if you use that technology and uh, it's so supposed to work that way, yeah. Right. Uh, well, as far as uh, blocking at the ISP level, where we are, mm, uh, have uh, uh, have to block uh, the main on their recursive servers, I think uh, that uh, uh, government at least currently thinks that it's okay that uh, most users uh, are protected and then uh, have uh, that domain in blocked and uh, the few that uh, configure TLS, DNS over TLS or so are not that important uh, but uh, we see the move to, to actually uh, block the domains at the registry level where that wouldn't matter. Yep. Um, one of the questions about is for the for the three the three of you operating registries. It says that DNS is geopolitical agnostic, and what are you working on as our Baltic registries? How are you collaborating to ensure regional and possible global DNS security leadership? Uh, yeah, I think it reminds me of your question uh, before this plenary. So. Do we as a Baltic, as a block, and do we call each other every morning and ask, how, how are you doing, Thomas, or uh, so, Timo, and uh, we don't do that, probably we should, so, yeah, we, we are actually meeting outside our office buildings and other uh, in center uh, e e uh, events, so, but, uh, yeah, that's a good e idea. Um. We're coming towards the end here, and there was a question I wanted to ask you, and, and I'll admit to you it's not easy. Um, it's 2023. We're, we live in an uncertain world. Uh, what are the things keeping you up at night? When you think about securing your registry, or Patrick, when you think about securing the ecosystem, what are the things that you don't have answers to that you wish you did that you think about late at night? I think uh, I'm mostly worried that uh, I haven't thought about everything, yeah. that the risk assessment wasn't correct, yeah. uh, you know, that we missed some things, and uh, uh, if you know what the problem might be, you can, you can also prepare a solution for it, so I'm afraid for unknowns, I guess. Timo, what's keeping you up at night? Um. I don't know. Maybe if it if if maybe it makes me a bad person, but I don't think much about DNS when I at night times, luckily. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I sleep very calmly, because as you as you told me, I'm middle aged now, so it's a, a age thing, I guess, <laughs> that keeps me up. Ivo. Yeah. I kind of agree that uh, there are, were things we're not, we, we were not thinking about before and uh, I think uh, Ukraine is also uh, which kind of opened our eyes on some things and we were learning on, on their example uh, because we're, when we were even uh, helping a little bit with some information where some information was incoming on their experience and uh, uh, one example, for example, is uh, the data. So in previous presentation, uh, I said that it was critical to rescue the data, uh, people. And uh, so we started to think, what if we store the data now somewhere? So outside the country, safely encrypted, so that we, in case of emergency, we don't have to think about that. And uh, so we have new uh, tasks, new policies, how we operate. And uh, so, and maybe what keeps me up uh, in the evenings when I think about that. So what are other things we didn't uh, thought about yet, so. So Patrick, from your perspective, looking at it more from a broader perspective systemically, I don't want to necessarily know what keeps you up at night because that would scare me, but um, what are the things that we don't have answers to that you wish we did? What are some of the things you'd like to see in the future that we can future-proof 
the DNS as an ecosystem? I think we still have all of these various security issues like signed domain names, validation of signed domain names, TLS certificates, some kind of routing security, whatever. I think each one of them is still a too low percentage regarding deployment. Uh, and that is something that we have to do together. And that actually keeps me up a little bit at night. At the moment, I'm a little bit more nervous about routing than, than, uh, than the, the DNS-related issues, specifically in this part of the world, because we are actually doing pretty good on the, on the, you know, on the DNS side, knock on wood. Um, so specifically, you're but, more worried about routing. What, what, what's an example of something that's worrying you right now? Well, for example, you see a combination, if you look at the, um, the eastern part of, of Ukraine, if you look at what happened 2014 when, when uh, Crimea was uh, uh, overtaken, if we look at the routing and how route announcements were done in BGP, we could actually have detected that someone's going on several months before it actually happened. And there are several academical studies uh, at the moment that looks at how rerouting of IP packets that are sourced on Crimea, how that over time is moved from Ukrainian ISPs to Russian ISPs is, is kind of interesting. We also see in Ukraine itself, um, when you have sort of, when Russia invaded Ukraine in the full scale invention, in invasion, you see various nasty things happening with routing. So that is part of the antagonist uh, terrorist state trying to do take over with traffic. And, and uh, that, of course, something that we together have been trying to address from Swedish perspective to help Ukraine of mitigating that kind of issue. But if you, if you mix an antagonist with physical attacks on the network that creates route, uh, routing issues and route flaps, together with various mistakes on how routing is set up, that might create situations at the moment that I'm a little bit nervous that we, are, that we don't really know how to detect and how to mitigate. So this is why routing, to me, is a little bit, makes me a little bit nervous. Um, but what makes me nervous is, is more that I think that all of us in this room, the reason why we're here is that we sort of, we have woken up. All of us probably have a really long list of things that we would like to do. And I'm always nervous that if I'm now working at not know with three things, I'm always nervous that antagonist uses number four, <laughs> which means that we're not, so it's that balance between working in a normal pace, but by doing that, there are certain things I will not be done with until next November. Staying in the DNS realm though, for just a second, you helped author a paper on the internet of things and the DNS. And uh, I think that was SAC 105. Um, there, were, there was a time a few years back where we spent a lot of time and a lot of effort thinking about a world with 50 billion new devices and how that might impact the security of the DNS. It's 2023 20, and I haven't quite seen that realized yet in terms of IoT's potential. But how do you feel about IoT and DNS today? Uh, to some degree, I think the, uh, the DNS, it's, it's secure enough for IT. The attacks on IT is more the HTTP layer, which is very, very weak, okay. which means that you're attacking on the application layer. Yep. Okay, here. There was a TV ad for ASICs many, many, many years ago. Okay. And you had two persons working out in the jungle, and the two persons see a lion. One of them opens the bag, take off some some uh, running shoes and the other person tells the one that ties on the running shoes but do you really think that you can run that you can outrun the lion just because you have running shoes and the answer is no but i will run faster than you <laughs> so what i'm a little bit nervous about is that we are now in the new situation with the war and different kind of attacks that we have problems understanding to what level should we polish the should we polish one system and forgetting other things, when in reality we need to keep all security things we have in balance. And we need to do a proper calculation so that we understand where the weak link is. 
too many people, I think, talk about, oh, a chain always have, uh, sorry, a chain might have a weak link. My view is that the important thing when you build a reliable system like DNS is that you must know which one of the links of the chain is the weakest. And then you keep your eye on that one and you have a plan for what to do when it breaks. If you don't know what is the weakest link in your system, that is when you, when you, when, when you, when you are in trouble. And if you don't know what is the weakest link of chain, that should make you nervous and not sleep at night. Not that you have a weak link, because everyone has one. So you just need to sort of understand what the context is that you operate in, and that will make things much better. Okay, so that's some very practical advice from our pen, friend Patrick. It is now 2.15, we've reached the end of the panel. I would like to thank Evo, Patrick, Timo and Tomas, thank you very much for spending your time with us.